Let's pray together. Father, we are so excited that you work among your people. We're so glad, Father, that you show up and change lives. We're so grateful for the time of worship that we've had today. And, and Lord, we want to invite your Holy Spirit now to show up and change hearts, show up and change our lives. Help us to become a little bit more like Jesus when we leave this place than we were when we entered the building. Lord, we invite you to help us love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We invite you to help us love our neighbor as ourselves. And we invite you to work in our hearts in such a way that our community knows that we love God because of the way we love them. So Lord, transform us today as we talk about surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible or your Bible app, I want to invite you to turn to Luke chapter five. We are continuing in our sermon series called The Son of God. And for all of 2022, we'll be preaching and teaching about life change from the gospel of Luke. If you did not bring a Bible with you today, you are invited to use one of the Bibles located underneath the seat in front of you and turn to page 1023. If you're at our Parker campus, you can jump up and grab one of the Bibles off the table at the back of Alumni Hall. Now, as always, if you do not have a Bible that you can read or understand easily, please take a Bible home with you. It is our gift to you. If somebody tries to stop you, hit them in the head with a Bible and take off running. I'm only kidding. But look, we believe so much in giving away Bibles. If you're searching for life change in 2022, read and apply God's word to your life and you'll discover that God will radically change your life. Now, our Parker campus, we are so glad that you've joined us today in Parker. God is doing such an incredible work among your community. You guys are on fire with the Spirit of God, and it is so amazing to see God working among you. Uh, you've been gifted with an entire campus. Think about that. Rather than meeting inside a school, which has been awesome, but you have to set up and tear down every weekend, before too long, you'll be gathering inside your own campus for worship and to share the life-changing message of Jesus with others. That is so cool. Now, if you're present at our McCulloch service or our McCulloch campus or the Sweetwater campus, you've probably realized that I am not there with you in person. COVID has once again disrupted the Donahue family. Now, I, I recognize that this strain going around is similar to the common cold, but over the last couple of years, many from our church and from our community, they've been severely sick. Some have died as a result. The coronavirus has hit some people harder than others. So as a precaution, and because I love you, I'm keeping my distance from you this weekend. So over the last couple of weeks, we've talked quite a bit about purpose in our Son of God series. Uh, I spoke a couple weeks ago about rejection that happens when you live with purpose. And last week, Pastor Chad talked about what living with purpose really looks like. We mentioned here at Calvary week after week that our mission as a church is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Have you ever wondered why we mention that mission as often as we do? Well, here's why. If Calvary as a church or collectively as individuals, if we ever forget our purpose and our mission, we're going to become nothing more than a country club. Now, I know this might sound ridiculous to even mention, but sometimes churches forget who they are and why they exist. So instead of having an outward focus on reaching people, 
They develop an inward focus. They focus on the comfort and the care and the preferences of the other people inside the church building with them. But most churches that do that, uh, they're never going to admit to it. Instead of valuing and pursuing people, instead of seeing people surrender to the life-changing power of Jesus, they begin to value the things that matter to the majority of the people inside the building, and they start catering to one another. They've forgotten their purpose. Uh, they engrave names of people on buildings. Sunday school rooms get nicknamed after leaders of their classes, and nobody else is allowed to use that classroom during the week because it's my classroom. Inward-focused churches focus on things that God doesn't really want us to care about. They argue about the color of the paint on the walls, the color of the carpet, the color of choir robes, if they have them, the color of their Bibles. They argue about the translations of the Bible to use and the qualifications of deacons. And really those inward focused churches become known in the community as a ch church that you would rather not visit as opposed to one that you want to go to. Now, confessionally, I've belonged to those churches. Have you belonged to those churches? Now, help me out. I know I'm not there with you, but let's have some group participation. All right, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. Raise your hand, be honest, if you've ever been involved with an inward-focused church. All right, thank you. Now, raise your hand if you heard people argue over silly things that don't matter inside of a church. Now, thank you. Raise your hand if your spouse is the one that caused most of that division. Don't raise your hand. See, that's why one of the reasons why here at Calvary, we talk about our purpose so much. If we don't, we will slowly begin to drift and we're going to become more focused on, on property, on possessions, rather than people. See, people who become followers of Jesus, meaning they've come to a point that they believe that God sent his son into the world to save the world, not condemn the world. They, they've had a moment that they surrendered their lives to God by trusting in Jesus as their savior. And they've been changed from the inside out in that moment of trust. And that, that split second when they surrendered their lives to Jesus, they became a follower of Jesus. And it all happened through surrender. But some people become followers of Jesus. They become a Christian through surrender and yet never surrender anything to God again. Now, we see an example of surrender in Luke chapter 5. If you and I want to continue to live surrendered lives to Jesus, it's important that as we as a church and Havasu, Parker, our online community, that we apply these important lessons to our lives. So let's read together. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation, uh, but you're welcome to follow along in whatever translation you'd like to use. Just don't argue about it. Let's read together Luke chapter five, beginning in verse one. One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asks Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and he taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. 
And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck by the number of fish that they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. Now, one of the ways that you and I can continue to live surrendered lives can be drawn out from verse one. Verse one tells us that as Jesus was teaching, great crowds were pressing in to hear him. The crowd was so big, Jesus had to get on a boat in the water far enough away that he could speak to the crowds, but not so far away that people could not hear them. So the question we ask is, why were these crowds pressing in to hear from Jesus? One of the reasons is because they understood what he was saying. Jesus spoke plainly to people, so let's do the same. See, Jesus spoke plainly to the people, so let's you and I speak plainly as well. Have you ever met somebody that spoke in your native language, probably English for most of you listening, but they used large, complicated, technical words and you had no idea what they were talking about, even though they were speaking English? Maybe you've watched a, a TED talk. Maybe you didn't understand what the person was saying. They were speaking about technology, medical breakthroughs, research, and they spoke in your native language, but you had no idea what they were talking about. I've sat in classes in college and in seminary, and I could tell the teachers in charge of the class were really brilliant. They were really smart. They used big words, and they really loved to hear themselves talk. And in seminary, they used churchy words. They, they used religious words. They used words like justification, sanctification, incarnation, transfiguration, hypostatic union, atonement. And my favorite word that they used was the word exegesis. Everybody say exegesis. When I first heard the word exegesis, I thought it was another name for Jesus. And then the professor started saying things like exegetical. And then I knew I was wrong. I had to look the word up and I read that the word exegesis simply meant an explanation of what a Bible passage means. Why didn't he just say that? Now, I guess that's fine in a seminary classroom environment, but what happens when a seminary trained pastor begin to use Christianese language in their pulpit? Then the members of their churches begin to use that language as well. See, then what happens is the people who need Jesus, those who are outside the walls of the church, they have no idea what we're talking about, so they seldom surrender their lives to Jesus. Now, just like Jesus taught plainly, you and I, if we use Christianese, we need to surrender our language, our verbiage to Jesus so people can understand and experience the life-changing power of Jesus in their lives. When the Apostle Paul was writing to the church in Corinth about speaking in tongues, he said this in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 19. 
But in a church meeting, I would rather speak five, five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. The principle that Paul's writing about applies to our language as well. Speak plainly to people so they can understand what we are saying. So, getting back to the passage of Scripture, Jesus taught plainly, large crowds gathered, and after Jesus used Peter's boat through a miracle of Jesus, Peter and the others caught such a huge haul of fish, the nets were tearing, both boats were filled to the verge of sinking. I absolutely love the response of Peter. It, it's the same response that I've heard from other people before. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. That response is so similar to what I've heard a hundred different ways from other people. People sometimes say things like, well, if I were to go to church, the building would collapse. Or if I were to go to church, the building would catch on fire. Or if you know what I've done in life, Pastor Joe, you wouldn't be talking to me about God. If you know my past, you wouldn't talk to me about God. Well, here's what I want you to understand. Jesus preferred relationships with sinners, not the religious. Jesus preferred relationships with sinners, not the religious. See, if you came to church today and you're under the impression that God only wants to connect with churchy people, you are wrong. You are way wrong. See, Peter seemed to have the same attitude toward Jesus, that Jesus doesn't want anything to do with him. Peter said to Jesus, I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. Please get this. 2,000 years ago, the God-man, Jesus, fully God, fully man, entered the world. And even though he went to the temple on a regular basis, Jesus seemed to prefer hanging out with sinners. We read in scripture that it was as his custom, Jesus would go to the synagogue for worship. Yet he didn't seem to hang out with the people he went to church with. He was always with the people outside the temple. He was always with the people who were not allowed to go into the temple. He connected with the people that didn't necessarily fit in with the churchy people. In fact, the churchy people, the religious leaders, they had a name for the people that Jesus hung out with. Do you know what that name was? They called the people that Jesus hung out with scum. I remember being called a scumbag when I was in middle school. That hurt my feelings. In Luke chapter 5, verse 30, the religious leaders asked Jesus and his followers, why do you eat and drink with such scum? So if you feel like scum, if you feel rejected, if you feel like you don't fit in at church, if you feel like you're too much of a sinner to be here at church today, I have good news for you. You are right smack dab where you belong. Jesus came to take away your sin. 1 John 3, 5. He takes away your sin when you stop trying to be good enough on your own. Stop trying to connect with God by doing good things and surrender your life to God by trusting Jesus as the one who takes away your sin and makes you a new person. You understand what I mean when I say he takes away your sin. It's no longer a part of you. Religious people, churchy people, they think that God is blessed 
to have them at church. God, I, I did something good today. I went to church. I've blessed God. But Jesus preferred to hang out with the people outside the walls of the church. There's no one in this room today that's perfect. I can say that because I'm not in the room with you today. But if I were there, it would still, there still would not be a perfect person here. Only a perfect, sinless person could ever be in the presence of God because of God's perfect nature, because of who God is. And if Jesus came to take away your sin, you can be in God's presence as well. So just take a moment and tell God you surrender to him and you trust Jesus as the one who took away your sin. Take that moment right now. Stop listening to me. And even while I'm preaching, invite God to change your heart. Surrender your sin to Jesus. Let the love of God fill your heart. Let the love of God flood your mind and surrender your life to him. And as you surrender your life to Jesus, and if you've already surrendered your life to Jesus, uh, then you realize that following Jesus requires surrender of more than sin. Following Jesus requires more surrender or, or surrender of more than just sin. See, Jesus invited Peter to follow him and he and his brothers, they left everything to follow Jesus. Verse 11 says, as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. These were fishermen. They surrendered more than sin and they surrendered their occupations and their occupations were not bad. It's not as though that they were strip club owners or, or pornographers. They weren't cheating people out of their money. They were fishermen and they walked away from their boats, from their nets, from their source of income because they wanted to follow Jesus. Now, I'm not suggesting that you walk away from your jobs. I'm not suggesting that you, uh, that surrendering your life uh, to Jesus requires you to change your occupation, but it might. Uh, if you earn a living cheating people out of, mo out of money, I can guarantee you, God is calling you out of that occupation. If you earn a living harming other people, hurting other people, if you earn a living that causes damage to other people, I guarantee you this, God is calling you to surrender that and walk away from that lifestyle. Now, I'm not talking about kickboxing and martial arts, anything like that. I'm talking about an occupation that destroys other people. Now, I don't know what God is calling you to surrender when it comes to your possessions. Peter and, and his, his brothers and, and James and the sons of Zebedee, they gave up their occupation. They gave up their boats and their nets. I don't know what God is calling you to surrender when it comes to your possessions, but I do know that God is calling you to surrender your time by serving. See, one of our core values here at Calvary is radical service. We see that happen in Peter and with his brothers. Radically, they gave up everything. Radically, they gave up what they had devoted their time to and they got involved with following Jesus. Have you surrendered your time? 
Have you thought about serving for one of our upcoming events or, or maybe our upcoming event, an evening of hope where we're ministering to special friends in our community and we're making them feel spectacular and we're rolling out the red car carpet and we're having paparazzi and we're taking pictures. Have you thought about applying to serve as a substitute teacher in our school system? Just this past week, the Lake Havasu School District sent out another email saying the need is great in our community. We need substitute teachers. H have you thought about surrendering your time to serve in our student ministry? They just got back or they're coming back today from a camp, from a winter retreat. They need people willing to invest in our junior high and our senior high. Have you thought about surrendering your time to serve in our children's ministry? See, there's a lot of other things besides sin that you and I need to surrender. And usually it's what occupies us the most that we need to surrender to God because it takes our time away from serving in our community and serving inside the church. So here's what I want to ask you to do. Ask God to show you what he wants you to surrender. I'm not talking about sin. Ask God to show you what he wants you to surrender, whether it's possessions, whether it's property, whether it's time, whatever it is. And I guarantee you, if God knows that you're willing to surrender something else to him, He'll show you what it is and he will use it to reach other people. And he will use you to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Is there anything greater that could happen through your surrendering? Let's pray together. Father, today we wanna say thank you. Thank you for showing up Thank you for changing hearts today. Thank you for transforming lives today. Thank you for this passage of scripture, this example that we see of Peter and, and, and John and James leaving everything to follow you. Show us what you want us to surrender. Show us what you want us to walk away from. Lord, we pray that we would be able to speak plainly to others just like you spoke plainly. Help us to surrender our language. Help us to surrender our thoughts. Help us to surrender our, our property, possessions, our time, whatever it is, so that you will use it to reach people with the loving, powerful arms of Jesus. Lord, we love you and we invite you to continue to work among us as we worship you. Let's stand together and let's worship.